have a copy in my possession and that is a conscious choice because I like thought about it because I do love this book but it does like it is really negative energy <laughs> I want it in my house okay is this hair giving us Michelle's been watching a little bit too much cheer on Netflix yeah hi I'm Michelle welcome back to my channel today we're gonna be talking about one of my favorite books of the year in one of the most controversial books on the internet we're gonna be talking about a little life by Hanya Yanagihara specifically what about a little life has made it notorious as this just terribly sad the saddest book of all time how has Hanya Yanagihara structured this book to be so effectively sad universally so if you like me have been around the book internet I'm sure you've seen this book um, first of all, can we talk about the cover? The cover of this book is one of my favorites. I think it's gorgeous. It's this black and white photograph. I cannot remember who the photographer is, but I will put it here. And it is called The Orgasmic Man. I thought he was a grumpy, sad man until I looked it up. And I think it's still up for debate, and I think that even adds more value. It's a Booker Prize finalist, and I think you will very frequently see it on lists of as people talking about it as like the saddest book they've ever read. It's written by Hanya Yanagihara, um, which I said before, and she is works in magazines. I think when she, at the time she wrote, A Little Life was working at a travel magazine. Um, I don't know if she's still working in magazines, um, but A Little Life was her second novel. Her first novel, The People in the Trees, was very small. She, I was listening, I listened to a lot of interviews of her in preparation for this, and she uh, said that like it sold like 10 copies. It did not have the same level of success as A Little Life, especially pre A Little Life. Um, it is about a scientist who is also a pedophile. I haven't read it. I started it, um, but then I had to return it to the library because um, they wanted it back. So I haven't finished it. I do plan on finishing it at some point because I do really enjoy Yanagihara's writing style. But again, this is her second book. It took her 18 months to write A Little Life, where she's the people in the trees to her close to five months. It was really this experience. And if you've seen A Little Life, it is like 800 pages long. So and she wrote it while she had a full time day job. She said that the experience of writing A Little Life was like significantly different from the people in the trees in that it like came out of her very quickly. Um, Hanya also talks about how she wrote A Little Life as kind of an ode to particularly male friendship, but friendship in general. She is unmarried and the most important relationships in her life have always been her friendships. And she felt like particularly male friendships were not depicted in the media. And there are some really beautiful explorations of friendships in this book. Before I get too deep into actually talking about A Little Life and what about A Little Life makes this book so sad, I do want to say as anyone who's talking about this book on the internet should say that this book has seriously heavy and potentially triggering content. If you have any concerns about that, you should look out content warnings. Honestly, even if you don't have concerns about that, you should check out content warnings. I won't be getting into the specifics of the, the traumatic events in Jude's life in this video, but I will be talking about them vaguely, and if you plan on reading it, you should know what you're getting into. I feel like I went into this book and I wasn't fully prepared. I had kind of heard the spiels from people, but as someone who doesn't typically look up triggering content for most things I was like oh I should be fine and it was maybe something I shouldn't have been reading it was like an emotional decathlon and I don't think I had been training for it like the emotional level in which this like hit me was something that took me quite a while to recover from did I enjoy the reading experience I don't know I now enjoy having read this story like I'm glad I have read it but I don't know if I was like going my brain got erased and I was asked to read it again if I would say yes because it really was pretty draining so take that as you will in this video we will be talking spoilers I will be spoiling things in this book I don't think this is a book that is particularly like ruined by spoilers this isn't like Gone Girl this isn't a thriller I think even if you know everything that's gonna happen you will have a pretty similar emotional experience with this book but um if spoilers are something you don't want then don't watch this we will be talking about spoilers but I will be keeping things relatively vague so I'm gonna be going through this book in the order it's written this book is written in seven parts the back of a little life tells you that this book is about four men who are friends in college who have now moved to New York City and chronicles their lives in New York City that is not true <laughs> I mean it's not false a little life is about four men 
but it's also about a lot more than four. I wouldn't even say that the four men that it lists, Malcolm, JB, Jude, and Willem, are the central four figures. They are very important, but it doesn't talk about Harold at all, and I, and I would consider Harold to be more important than, for sure, Malcolm, but like also potentially JB. So it doesn't really give you the full picture. Let's kind of go through these four, though, because they are pretty central to the plot. First of all, we have Malcolm. He is the least interesting of the crew. He is an architect. He is um, a black man, but he came up from a very wealthy background. Um, I don't remember exactly what his parents do, but they live in the city and are very well-to-do. JB um, is an artist. He is also black, but he is the son of a single mother who is an immigrant from Haiti, I believe. Um, so very different upbringings. Malcolm and JB's lives are often put in kind of in contrast with each other because for as much as they have in common as far as them being black men, their upbringings were vastly different. And then we have Willem. He is the actor. He grew up in rural Midwest somewhere from a poor farm family and he had a younger brother who I believe had cerebral palsy and spent his whole life in a wheelchair and a lot of Willem's early life is kind of defined by the fact that he has this brother with a disability um, and kind of the ways in which his family was not equipped to handle that. And we have Jude St. Francis. Um, he is really who this book is about. This book is about Jude St. Francis and the people who love him. Jude, when we are introduced to Jude, we don't know very much about him. He's very secretive. We know that he's really smart. He is a lawyer, but also has a um, PhD, I believe, in math. He has a car-related injury that is causes him sometimes debilitating like leg and back pain, um, but it seems to be very episodic. But Jude has lots and lots of layers, and he's just like, he's very sweet, like, he's very kind, that's what we know about him, but he's also very mysterious. That's where we're introduced to Jude. And this opening part of the book acts as an invitation to join these boys' as friend group. We're introduced to the first three guys from their perspectives, and we kind of see Jude throughout all of them and we have this invitation to participate with these these men these young men and I think that's really important I think the first act the first part of this book acts as an invitation then we get into the second part of the book and this is I think where we see a little life start to really transform into something we weren't expecting the first part is what you're expecting based off the back cover it's kind of confusing I kept getting all the men confused as I was reading the back I have to like keep flipping back to the back cover and be like okay wait which one was Malcolm again it is you're like okay I've read similar stories to this before the writing is beautiful but it's not like you're like, okay, I don't, I don't get the hype yet. We get into book two and you start to understand because book two is about Jude, or part two, excuse me. Part two is about Jude. A question that comes up a lot as we're talking about a little life is whether this is trauma porn. And I would give a staunch no to that. I don't think it is. It is unquestionable that the amount of trauma that we see in Jude St. Francis's life is unimaginable, un unfathomable for most people, that it is a lot. But I think the thing that really differentiates it is the fact that, that trauma is not used as a way to kind of objectify Jude. I don't think that is central to Yonagahara's story. It is a part of Jude and it is a, a way that we are given to understand Jude better. I don't think it is a way for us to distance ourselves from Jude, which I think is what I would consider trauma porn. Anyway, this book is like really long. It's like seven or eight hundred pages, and there is such a small percent that is actually focused on his trauma. Most of it is focused on the present and focused on these relationships that he has with people. And I think in part two we really see that as we see that for the first time this warmth and perspective from Harold. Harold is one of Jude's law professors from law school, but they create this relationship that is almost familial. Harold kind of takes Jude under his wing. He winds up inviting Jude to dinner. Um, they spend time at like his beach house together with him and his wife Julia. This section is also, in part two, we also get the first point of view shift. Most of this book is told in a very close third person. It's in like third person, he did this, he did this. But it's like very close. You can see the thoughts. It's very intimately connected to whatever character we're following in that particular part. And all of the four men get a chance to like narrate their own chapters with throughout the book. Harold's chapters are told a little differently. Harold tells his chapters in first person. Harold is talking to 
the reader. We find out later that he's actually talking to a portrait of Willem and um, that was painted by JB. So in this way he's getting to talk to kind of all of them. Um, and this portrait of Willem is Willem listening to Jude, painted by JB. So kind of three of the four men, again Malcolm is not included. Malcolm is uh, often excluded. <laughs> Um, so Harold is in this way communicating with kind of all three men and us. This perspective is, it is very different than the other perspectives because it is so intimate and loving. Harold loves all these boys, particularly he like loves Jude. I'm going to read you one of my favorite passages from the book from Harold's perspective. So in this uh, passage, Harold is talking about um, all the boys are at a at his beach house with him and Julia and he's kind of writing or talking about this mo little moment that happens between Willem and Jude. And then you touched his shoulder and moved in front of him and knelt and retied one of his shoelaces that had come undone and then fell back in step with Julia. It was so fluid, a little gesture, a step forward, a fold onto a bended knee, a retreat back to her side. It was nothing to you. You didn't even think about it. You never even paused in your conversation. You were always watching him, but you all were. You took care of him in a dozen small ways. I saw all of this over those few days, but I doubt you would remember this particular incident. But while you were doing it, he looked at me, and the look on his face, I still cannot describe it other than in that moment, I felt something crumble inside me, like a tower of damp sand built too high for him, and for you, and for me as well. And in his face, I knew my own would be echoed, the impossibility of finding someone to do such a thing for another person, so unthinkingly, so gracefully. When I looked at him, I understood for the first time since Jacob died what people meant when they said someone was heartbreaking, that something could break your heart. I had always thought it mawkish, but in that moment I realized it might have been mawkish, but it was also true. Um, so that's a little passage from Harold's section. So you kind of get a sense of his POV and how different that might be from like a cold, closed third. In this section, we also get to delve a little bit into Harold's past. And Harold also becomes a character we really care for. We learn that Julia is Harold's second wife, and with his first wife, he had a son named Jacob who died when he was five. Um, I believe he had cancer, um, and we kind of see the the pain and the, the ripples and the grief that that loss caused him, and also the fact that he was a father. Um, and, and then he becomes a father figure to Jude. So in that passage that I read from Harold's perspective, we also get a, a sense of Yana Gahara's language. And I think this is something that she does unquestionably well. Okay, it is questionable because I've heard people whine about it. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And I think her use of language is really interesting and is a way to create such a vivid story. It is truly a stunning use of prose that I think somehow manages to walk the tightrope between accessible and beautiful. I, at some point, I think it was Brandon Sanderson, he talked about there's two ends of prose. Something can either be window pane prose or stained glass prose. So regardless of this metaphor, what is happening outside is like the story. So what you can see through the window is the story. And a stained glass prose, you're less focused on actually what is the story, what is the like plot and more focused on kind of like the beauty, the artistry of the language itself. We're saying that was just window pane prose. You look right through it. You don't want to see it. You don't want to sense it. And I think Yana Gahara does such a beautiful job of creating language that is both beautiful and something that you can see right through and get lost in. So reading her book, despite the fact that it is huge, it once you kind of get into it, I feel like it reads very quickly. But I think one thing that is really interesting is it's not overly quotable. Her passages are in incredibly poignant but they need to be in context like that passage I read you was like the smallest chunk I could to get that sense across and get that like message and I didn't read you you probably lost the context a little bit because this is actually him in response to something that Willem said about like loving Jude and there's a, a lot more context and it is very hard to decontextualize these pieces of language and you'll find that despite this being a very well read book in something that typically would be like super quotable you'd see these quotes all over like Instagram you won't find a lot of them because most of them aren't as poignant out of context and I think for me this really demonstrates the fact that for Yana Gahara language is the instrument not the message itself so if part one was an invitation to join the friend group I think part two is a promise of good things for Jude part two ends on such a beautiful note I have like jokingly said that you should just read the first two parts if you're like worried about like the the trauma of this book just read parts one and two you get Yana Gahara's beautiful writing you get to meet these wonderful men and then you can go home and think they have a happy ending but by allowing us 
to be invited to love Jude and then a promise that good things are going to happen for Jude, we feel comfortable enough to start loving Jude. And that's probably a mistake. <laughs> So part three, I think, focuses on JB. Not entirely, but he becomes one of these central figures. We start to see JB fall into addiction. And I think this is where we really start to see Yanagihara's creation of this as a world of extremes. This has unrealistic levels of everything. Unrealistic levels of success. All these men are the most successful men in the field. Unrealistic levels of trauma. Jude has had literally everything that could possibly happen to him happen to him. Wealth. These men are just like undeniably wealthy. This is not a world that is painted with the goal of being realistic. But somehow we don't, or at least I didn't, get lost in this world of unrealism. She does it slow enough, like, you know, like a frog in boiling water where you aren't like, this doesn't make any sense. But Yanagihara wanted to play in these extremes. She wanted to cr contrast the use of subtlety and the use of these like shades of gray that we find in most like literary fiction these days. Like that's the trend is to have things that are like very in the middle, very gray. She wanted to play with extremes. I also think it really creates this kind of like fairy tale world. A little life, if I were to like not base the genre on like the story but on the structure it would live somewhere between fairy tale and thriller it's a fairy tale in the sense that we have these like epic characters who have just like huge overwhelming character traits right willem is like the kindest man you'll ever meet and jb has had the worst past you've ever had and they're all the best in their fields we have this world of extremes that really lends itself to this fairy tale world and we also have this aspect of a thriller though we don't know exactly what happened to jude and we're also trying to uncover that i think another element of this is there are very clear good guys and bad guys in this book we've got the bad guys the um brother luke and the doctor from his past and Caleb I think Caleb we'll talk about Caleb later despise the man and then we have like the good guys we have Jude we have Harold we have Willem and there's not a lot of overlap not that Hanya Yanagihara ignores nuance none of them are perfect but nothing that Willem does even brings him close to putting him in the realm of a bad guy he makes mistakes because he doesn't fully understand situations or because he prioritizes things in the wrong way, but he's never making mistakes because he's like evil. Just as no amount of Brother Luke's kindness would make him like a good guy in this book. Except JB. JB is this character that is a little bit more removed from this world of extremes, and I think JB is the only one who's allowed to be morally gray. He's the only one who is allowed to be flawed in a way that makes you question his character. So, like I said, part three is really about JB's addiction. And Jude is kind of trying to step in and take care of him. And JB, JB makes fun of him and says some, like, pretty unforgivable things to Jude that irrevocably alters JB's friendship, not only with Jude, but also with Willem. I think this section is particularly important, one, because we are allowed to see JB as this morally gray character. Hanya Yanagihara said JB is the character she most associates with, and I think if we were really honest with ourselves, JB is probably the character that most of us would be most closely related to. He's allowed to have these dark parts, and he's allowed to kind of engage with Jude's trauma in a way that is very self-centered and unkind in a way that I'm sure we all have. JB is the most human of all four of the men and he is the only character who makes it out of the book alive. So in this section I think we are asked to pick a side. So we were invited into the friend group and then we were promised good things and now we are being we're kind of seeing these lines of delineation and we are being asked to pick a side and there's like a very clear winner like who in their right mind is picking JB in this disagreement with Jude and JB. Literally no one. People hate JB so much. Um, part four for me is the most troubling section of this entire book. This is the part of the book that I had to like close multiple times because it was incredibly hard to read. It felt like being beaten with a baseball bat while reading this book. How does Yonagahara keep us reading even though this book is <laughs> like traumatic? And I think it is that thriller structure I mentioned in the last section. We want to know what happened to Jude. We are left with so many mysteries we know enough pieces of that we know something really bad happened but we don't know what another thing is the chapters are really long <laughs> so like i said the book is divided into seven parts but within each of those parts for the most part there are three chapters and those chapters are 
not short. They're like at least 50, they're like 50 pages probably on average, which keeps you reading. And I also think the consistent structure keeps you reading. You like know what is going to happen in the fact that there are going to be three sections and each part and each section is going to be narrated by a particular character, whether that is Harold in his first or it is one of the guys in their third. So here I want to talk a little bit about Jude's past. Like I said, I'm not going to get into specifics, but this section really delves into his time with Brother Luke in which, which is over the course of, I believe, about two years in which he was taken from hotel to hotel and was essentially like trafficked by Brother Luke. The length and severity of the abuse in this chapter is hard to read. And we also start to really feel, we've kind of seen it briefly in the previous chapters, but we really start to feel it here, this cycle that Jude fell into in his childhood and continues to fall into as an adult, where we see things kind of pushed to as worse as we think they can get. And then there's this glimmer of hope and then things somehow cycle to be even worse. Jude's childhood was emblematic of this childhood in which he experienced no real love and only was used and it is uh terrible and we see this echoed with the storyline of caleb this storyline with caleb is the um for me what the most upsetting thing in this entire book was caleb because the rest of jude's abuse is in the past caleb is in the present so even though jude should be like safe now he's not He's the cycle of abuse has continued to follow him into kind of like the safety or this this false sense of safety he had in the present. And Jude, because of this cycle in his childhood, has severe PTSD, which is you know one of the central themes of this book, and um, believes he was made for this. There is um, this part is called the axiom axiom of equality, um, which is that x equals x, and it kind of goes into the mathematical framework behind this. But that's how he how. Jude sees himself is he sees himself as this is how he is he's someone who kind of was meant to be abused um, and because of this the cycle follows him into adulthood um Caleb is if I could have any fictional character come to life um, so I could literally just like beat them um, it would be Caleb I would love to beat this man up that is my dream in life so Caleb is um, Jude's boyfriend and it's the first time that Jude has entered into a romantic relationship and it quickly becomes abusive and the abuse really escalates very quickly um, and by the end um, Jude is attacked by Caleb and it ends with him being pushed down the stairs after this very violent assault. This is incredibly important though as we learn about Brother Luke in the past and we learn Caleb in the present we learn that Jude is not safe now that just because he has escaped kind of his terrible, terrible guardians that he had as a child, whether those were legal or illegal guardians, um, he is still not safe. I think up until this point, we had this sense of Jude's trauma being in the past. And with Caleb, we were reminded that Jude is not safe here any more than he was as a child. This chapter evokes like an impulse to protect Jude. You want to protect Jude from what's going on around him. And I think this is a little bit problematic sometimes, at least for me, as I was reflecting back on it. I start to infantilize Jude a little bit. This book starts with Jude like 28 and I think by the time Caleb stuff is happening he's definitely in his late 30s if not in his 40s. I think he's in his late 30s. And but there's this impulse to protect him because he like clearly cannot protect himself and we like see him as a child and we see him having these same things happen to him as an adult so we have this impulse to protect him part five is the happy years and as people will tell you they aren't that happy but i actually think most of the happy years are pretty happy just the last couple pages are where things get real unhappy we are really starting to see the ripples of Jude's self-harm and self-destruction. Hanya Yanagahara does such a gorgeous job, I think, depicting Jude's mental state. He talks a lot about his past being like hyenas. And these memories from his past, no matter what he does, um, in quiet moments, attack him like hyenas. And one of the only things that he feels like he can do to control these impulses is self-harm. And it is troubling to everyone around him. Um, and so he starts to start to hide it and we kind of have this like cycle of like control and isolation and him not wanting to be around people because he doesn't want them to get upset but then that isolation causing him to spend 
more time reflecting on these memories and it becomes really cyclical and there's this big feeling of helplessness from everyone around him and I think that is really echoed in the readers like there's nothing we can do to help Jude just like there's nothing really Willem and Harold are able to do to help Jude with these memories he refuses to go to counseling because he had like you know like a pretty bad experience with a psychiatrist and by pretty bad I mean like he was like kidnapped and then hit by a car by a psychiatrist so like a reasonable fear of the mental health system. We also, in this section though, get to really spend some time with Willem. Willem and Jude have always been like best friends, they're the closest out of the four. But in this section they start a, a relationship that really like feathers the line between romantic and friendship. It starts as really just like an extension of their friendship into something a little bit more physical and romantic. So Willem becomes this like Prince Charming character. He takes on this role for Jude as someone who is able to love him and not fully, but sometimes Jude is even able to accept this love. We kind of skim over some of the happiness, but we know that they have several years where things are going like fairly well for them. And I think in this part we get my favorite passage from the entire book and I think one of the sweetest, most hopeful moments in the entire book. I'm going to read it to you. So this comes from... Um, Jude has a lot of nightmares from his PTSD, from his childhood. So, sometimes the dreams are so vivid, so real, that it takes a minute, an hour, for him to return to his life, for him to convince himself that the life of his consciousness is in fact real life, his real life. Sometimes he wakes so far from himself that he can't remember who he is. Where am I? He asks, desperate, and then who am I? Who am I? And then he hears, so close to his ear, that it is as if the voice is originating inside his own head. Willem's whispered incantation. You are Jude St. Francis. You are my oldest and dearest friend. You are the son of Harold Stein and Julia Altman. You are the friend of Malcolm Irvine, of Jean-Baptiste Marion, of Richard Goldfarb, of Andy Contractor, of Lucian Voigt, of Citizen Van Stratton, of Rhodes and Aerosmith, of Elijah Kozman, of Phaedra de los Santos, of Henry Young's. You're a New Yorker. You live in Soho. You volunteer for an arts organization. You volunteer for a food kitchen. You are a swimmer. You're a baker. You're a cook. You're a reader. You have a beautiful voice, though you never sing anymore. You're an excellent pianist. You're an art collector. You write me lovely messages when I'm away. You're patient. You're generous. You're the best listener I know. You're the smartest person I know in every way. You're the bravest person I know in every way. You're a lawyer. You're the chair of the litigation department at Rosen, Pritchard, and Klein. You love your job, and you work hard at it. You're a mathematician, you're a logician, you've tried to teach me and again and again. You were treated horribly, and you came out on the other end. You were always you. And then Jude asks, and who are you? Looking at the man who is holding him, who is describing someone he doesn't recognize, someone who seems to have so much, someone who seems like such an enviable, beloved person. Who are you? The man seems to have an answer to this question as well. I am Willem Ragnarsson, he says, and I will never let you go. I made it through without crying, but like, we got close to the end. Guys, uh, it's very sad. <laughs> I'm like losing it. You can hear it in my voice. Part six, and this is like a probably the biggest spoiler. Um, Willem dies. Willem dies in a car accident with Malcolm, and um, it feels like a huge betrayal. We understand underdog stories we know that fairy tales are supposed to have happy endings we know how redemption stories are supposed to work and Hanya Yanagahara undercuts all of that William promises that I will never let you go and he goes and dies and he does let Jude go at this point in the novel I am like ready to egg Miss Yanagahara's house um, because I do feel like she's like kind of betrayed the like contract we had I this is set up to be a fairy tale he's supposed to get a happy ending it reminds me of this quote, which as I was like looking it up, it turns out this quote is actually like a misquote of G.K. Chesterton, and so technically Neil Gaiman misquoted Chesterton. But it is, fairy tales do not tell children dragons exist, children already know dragons exist. Fairy tales tell children dragons can be beaten. And this book was set up to be a fairy tale. This was set up to be the story of how this boy with a terrible, terrible past grows into a man who has wonderful friends and a wonderful life and is so successful and has a happy, happily ever after. So in some ways, this part feels like a violation of the author's promise to us. Even though Yana Gahara never promised us that Jude would get a happy ending. Um, it's an assumption that I think even, 
even though you know, go into this book knowing that it's sad, I don't think I realized what a bleak ending this would have. Jude is having a very hard time in the wake of Willem's death. Um, he had gained a lot of coping skills that depended on Willem and was actually in... I don't know if getting better is the right way, but he was coping with his past. And when I think about this book, it is almost always in reference to this part of the book, um, particularly the section in which Jude, who has is like withering away, Harold has asked Jude to promise him that he won't kill himself, and so instead he is slowly starving to death because um, that feels less like a violation of that promise. This section oh, is just like so sad, um, and Juliet and Harold attempts to get through it to Jude to ask him to like give him tools to succeed and ask him to like stay with them are almost painted as selfish. Jude is like suffering. Harold and Julia are prolonging that suffering. Um, which I, you know, is that problematic? That is another tale for another day. But I think we can see that like Jude's suffering is like very real. The, bra the cruelty that ultimately breaks Jude is not his unimaginable past. But losing, but his grief over losing the love of his life, his best friend. And I think in this section, we move from pity to empathy. We have been, or at least I have, I spent most of the book pitying Jude, right? I had a much better childhood than Jude did by like exponential leaps and bounds. But in this, this section, I can empathize with this sense of grief over losing someone. Because that's something that all of us should be so lucky to experience, right? To love someone and have a best friend that closely and then to lose them. And so I think in part six and why this book is truly so sad is because, not because we pity Jude for everything terrible that happened to him, but we empathize with Jude. Hanya Yanagihara set out to write a story about someone who didn't get better. The book was supposed to be an ombre from light and hopeful to dark and bleak, but she doesn't leave us in the dark. It ends where it all begins, with Harold reflecting back on a memory he has of Jude telling him the story of Willem and him at Liz Bernard Street. It ends with Harold reflecting on Jude with love and warmth. I lied a little when I said this book is about Jude. While Jude is at the center of this story, it is just as much a story about Harold and Willem and Malcolm and JB and Andy and Julia and us, the readers. Because that's what Hanya Yanagihara does so beautifully. She makes Jude real and then she makes us love him. We see his struggles, we see his moments of joy, and we can't help him just like the people in his life can't seem to help him. But she doesn't leave us alone. We get to sit with Harold at the end of the novel and mourn our friend Jude St. Francis. And that is Hanya Yanagihara's final gift to us is that we don't have to mourn Jude alone. We've been invited into this friendship with all of them. And it is terrible and it is bleak and it is heartbreaking, but we don't have to go through it alone. We are going through it with Harold at our side. Um, and so that is why A Little Life is so effing sad. Because y Hanya Yanagihara tricked us into loving Jude and then she did it. She was mean to him. Roll mean to him. Um, should you read A Little Life? I don't know. I'm not, that is not something I can decide for you. I will tell you it is like an emotional decathlon, but I truly think it is one of the most stunning pieces of literature I have ever read. Um, I don't know if I've ever read a book that is so, um, well constructed. So, do with that what you may. Those are my thoughts on A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara and why it is so effing sad. Um, like I said, subscribe if you want. You can write a comment. What was your favorite part of A Little Life? Do you have a favorite part? Is it weird to have a favorite part? Do you have an X equals X tattoo? Because I don't think you should. I actually think that is an incredibly bad message. So, maybe we read different books, or maybe that's a reminder not to have a message. I don't like it. I, like, really, like, am troubled when people have X equals X tattoos. I'm also troubled when this is people's favorite book. I liked this book, but it is not my favorite. Because I've read books where good things happen. Which is most other books, actually. Um, this book seems a little bleak to be anyone's favorite. I know I painted it in, like, a pretty, like, positive light in this, but... And I liked it. It's certainly not my favorite. Certainly not my favorite. Anyway, um, that's all. Bye!